For those of you who are visiting for the first time, let me explain what we do on Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights are more of a Bible study than a church service. We intentionally go more in depth, and we spend more time on the subject we're studying. In fact, most of the time, we go through a book of the Bible verse by verse. And in the last 22 years, we've gone through several books. We've gone through the book of Ephesians verse by verse, the book of James, the book of Jude, the book of Revelation, and the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, currently, we're studying the book of Genesis, but we're not going through it verse by verse. And the reason we're not is because that would take too long. You know, I had one person come up to me and ask, well, Pastor, how long would it take? And I thought about it. It would probably take about 10 years to go through the book of Genesis verse by verse because you're only doing it once a week. And if you calculate 52 weeks, and someone's going to get upset when I say this, the vacations I take, then you would realize it's going to take a long time to get through. So we're not going verse by verse. What we're doing is we're studying the four major events in Genesis and the four major characters. The four major events are creation, the fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. The four major characters are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Now, we've already gone through the four major events, so now we're in the process of studying the first major character of Genesis, which is Abraham. And so far, we, we have covered two events in Abraham's life. We've covered the divine call where God commanded Abraham to leave his native country, his family, and to go to a land that he would show him. And in return, God promised to do seven things for him. He promised to turn Abraham's descendants into a great nation, to bless Abraham, to make his name great, to make him a blessing to others, to bless those that bless him and his descendants, and to curse those that cursed him and his descendants. And last but not least, God promised that through him, people from every nation would be blessed. So Abraham obeyed God, and he traveled to the land that God showed him. But a problem occurred. When he got there, there was a famine. So that brings us to the second event in Abraham's life that we've already covered. Instead of trusting God to provide for him during this famine, what did he do? He actually went down to Egypt. And of course, he got into trouble because he was out of God's will, and he was commanded to leave Egypt by the Egyptian Pharaoh. But God was true to his word. Remember, God promised to bless him. So even though Abraham was out of God's will, God blessed him, and he was able to keep all of the gifts that the Pharaoh had given him. So even though Abraham left Egypt in disgrace, he also left Egypt very wealthy. And that's where we're going to pick the story up in chapter 13. So if you would, turn in your Bible to chapter 13. We're going to read the first four verses. And let me tell you what I encourage you to do. I encourage you on Wednesday nights to bring a highlighter. To bring a nice pen, not the type that kind of glops everywhere, but a really fine one. And to take notes as we're going through. And I'll tell you why. As you go through these books, verse by verse, and here we're doing it event by event. But anyways, as we go through these books, you won't believe the notes that you've taken. Now, I don't have to do this, and I'll tell you why. I've got a program that after I do my sermons, Shirley comes in and she takes all the scriptures that I use. And she loads it into this program, and it tells what sermon it is. So if I'm teaching on a certain verse, or I want to look at a verse, I go back and I look at what I've taught on in the last 22 years. So everything that I'm taught is on record. Now, you can do the very same thing. If you bring a highlighter and a pen, you won't have it on computer, but you can do it in the margins of your Bible. So I encourage you to do that. Well, let's read the first four verses in in Genesis chapter 13. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, he and his wife and all that belonged to him, and Lot with him. Now, Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold, and he went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been in the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now, as I said, Abraham left Egypt in disgrace. To be brutally honest, he was humiliated. He had walked out of God's will, and he had gone down to Egypt because of his lack of faith. And things got out of hand very quickly. One sin led to another, and before Abraham knew it, he was in a real mess. You see, he lied about Sarah being his wife, and because of that, Pharaoh stepped in because she was so beautiful, and he took her to be his wife. And if it hadn't been for God intervening, Abraham would have lost Sarah for good. But eventually, of course, through God's work, the truth came out, and Pharaoh returned Sarah to Abraham without her being violated, and that's a very important little truth there, but Pharaoh publicly rebuked Abraham. 
And he commanded him to leave Egypt. But I will say this. Abraham was much wiser as a result of all the things that occurred while he was down in Egypt. Yes, he had doubted God, and he'd walked out of God's will, but he saw where it had gotten him. He saw the consequences of his actions. So the first thing that he did after he left Egypt was to hightail it to Bethel to repent. Look at verses 3 and 4. And he went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly. And there Abraham, or Abram, called on the name of the Lord. Now, I want you to notice the last part of verse number 4. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. In other words, he repented. He confessed his sin to God. He said, Lord, I'm sorry I did that. I'm never going to do that again. And he was restored to full fellowship with him. And the great thing is, we can do the very same thing when we get into sin. When we walk out of God's will and we begin to see the real mess that we've created. We can always go back, repent, and, and commit to walking in God's will. And guess what God does? He forgives us and he restores us into full fellowship with him. Look at what 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9 says. If we confess our sins. Now, here's what the word confess means. That word confess is translated from the Greek compound word homologeo. Now, a compound word is a word that's made up of one word, uh, more than one word. In this case, it's made up of two words. The prefix homo, which means the same. We use that word in several of our English words, homogenized milk. We take the cream out, we mix it up so you don't have the cream and the milk. It's all one thing. Homosexual means the same sex. So you've got that prefix homo, which means the same, and logos, which means to speak. So the word confess literally means to speak the same thing. God, you say it's sin. I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm going to say the same thing. I'm going to agree with you. What I did was sin. Forgive me for it. And so what the Bible says, if we confess our sin, then God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So now we can walk in full restoration and full fellowship with God. Now, as I said, out of fear of God, Pharaoh allowed Abraham to keep all the gifts that he'd given him. And the implication is that Abraham was a very kind and a very generous man. All you have to do is read through the book of Genesis and you'll see that Abraham was too kind-hearted. He had too soft of a heart. And many times it got him to trouble. And because he was very generous, he shared Pharaoh's gifts with Lot, so they both came out of Egypt very, very wealthy. But this created a problem. Look at verses 5 and 6 here in Genesis chapter 13. It says, Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, and the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. Now, these two verses specifically state that Abraham and Lot's wealth created a problem. And the problem was the land couldn't sustain all of the livestock that they both possessed. There wasn't enough pasture and water in one spot for all of their flocks to graze and to be watered. Now, the same thing's going to hap happen later on to Abraham's grandchildren. Wouldn't you like to get to the point where you are so wealthy or so blessed that you go, you know what? Tahlequah can't sustain all of us. We're going to have to move out. But you see, God had blessed Abraham and Lot so much that they couldn't stay together because the land couldn't sustain them. And that happened later on with Abraham's grandsons, with Esau and Jacob. Look with me, if you would, in Genesis chapter 36, verses 6 through 7. Esau took his wives and sons and daughters and all the members of his household as well as his livestock and all of his other animals and all the goods he had acquired in Canaan and he moved to a land some distance from his brother Jacob. Why did he do this? Because they didn't get along? No. If you remember, God did a work on Esau's heart so when Jacob came back, there was restoration. There was reconciliation. There was no an an animosity between the two. So why did he move? Well, look at the next verse. Their possessions were too great for them to remain together. The land where they were staying could not support them both because of their livestock. So basically, Abraham and Lot had a good problem. They had so much wealth in livestock that the land couldn't sustain the both of them. 
And the only solution was to split up and for each to go their own way. But before we look at how they separated, I want to look at how the problem manifested itself. Because if we see how the problem manifested itself, we can also see how Abraham dealt with it. And there's a good lesson to learn when we look at that. So let's look at how the problem manifested itself. Turn with me, if you would, to, the verse, to verses 6 and 7. And the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now, the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling in the land. Now, have you ever noticed that every once in a while you're reading along, it's like something's thrown in there. It's like, why did they put that in there? And you look at the last part of verse number 7, and you think, well, yeah, it's the land of Canaan. The Canaanites dwelling there, and the Perizzites are there. And if you go a little bit further in, in, into the Negev, you also have the Amorites down there. And to the right, you have the Moabites. Well, actually not yet, because we're going to find out that's going to be the descendants of Lot. But anyways, you have other people too, but specifically it tells us that the Canaanites and the Perizzites were there. Now, the reason God puts that detail in there is because it has something to do that the prob with the problem that's been created. So, what this is saying is they could not dwell together because the land could not sustain them. In other words, because the land couldn't sustain their herds of livestock, the herdsmen had to allow them to graze further and further from the camp, which means that the Canaanites and the Perizzites who were living in the land at that time, could rustle them very easily. You see, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, they were farmers. And where did you farm? Did you farm in the mountains? No, you might be able to grow your grapes there. You would have your vineyard there. But you farmed in the valleys. So they lived in the valleys where the farming was good. And if Abraham's and Lot's livestock happened to stray too close to the valleys, hey, it's free meat. That's why the Canaanites and the Perizzites are mentioned in verse number 7. So the herdsmen began losing livestock because they couldn't keep all of the herds together close enough to the camp to be able to protect them from the people who were rustling them. And the only way you were going to be able to stop that is to get them close to the camp. But again, there's not enough water. There's not enough grass close to the camp for both parties. So Abram's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen begin to argue over whose herds get to stay closest to the camp. Who's going to have to take the herds further away? And so now strife begins. This creates a problem. So Abraham, being the wiser of the two, decides to confront the problem and to nip it in the bud. Now every time I hear that phrase, nip it in the bud, I always am reminded of Barney Fife. How many of you remember Andy Griffin, Barney Fife? He always believed you need to nip it in the bud. Well, that was Abraham. He saw the strife that this was creating, and he decided to confront the problem and nip it in the bud. In other words, to stop it before it got out of hand, before him and Lot got into it. And he knew that the only solution to the problem was for him and Lot to split up and for them to go their own ways. So look at what Abraham said. Turn to verses 8 and 9. Then Abraham said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me. You see, it starts with the herdsmen. But pretty soon they're coming and they're griping to you. And the other herdsmen are griping to Lot. And Lot realizes that eventually you and I are going to get into it. And so he says, please, let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we're brothers. We're family. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right. Or if to the right, then I will go to the left. Now, if you understand the culture at that time, this is quite impressive. What Abraham did is, is very generous, and let me explain why. In their culture, at, their, at, at that time, as the uncle and the eldest, it was his right, Abraham's right and privilege to have first choice as to which direction he would go. You always did that. He was now the patriarch of the family. You always deferred to him. So he had every right, and it was his privilege to come and say, the land can't sustain us, we're going to have to separate, and I will tell you where I'm going to go, and then you can go in a different direction. But he didn't do that. He comes in and he gives up his right and his privilege to make the first choice. And this is what I want you to understand. The whole purpose of the story is to show you the contrast between Abraham's character 
and Lot's character. You see, as we go through these stories, we're going to see what type of man Abraham is. We're going to see what type of man Lot is. And what God wants us to do is to compare ourselves to each of these people. Am I like Abraham or am I like Lot? Now, there's a big difference between the two. And right off the bat, Abraham gives up his right and his privilege to choose which land he wants for the sake of peace, which speaks volumes of his character. And Lot's response also speaks volumes about his character. You see, Lot should have politely deferred to Abraham. He should have declined the offer to choose first, but he didn't. You see, in that culture, many times the patriarch would come in and he would say, this is what I'm going to do. And the other one was supposed to say, oh, no, 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 and defer. That was just the gracious thing to do. If you go through the Old Testament, you'll see this time and time again. The person will make an offer. The other person goes, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. But the only reason he was making the offer was to be gracious, to be hospitable, to show that I want reconciliation. I don't want us to be angry at each other. So what Lot should have done is he should have politely deferred to Abraham, and he should have declined the offer to be able to choose which land he wanted to go to. Look at verses 10 and 11, because he didn't do this. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and he saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was like the garden of the Lord. Now, what is the garden of the Lord? Anyone? Garden of Eden. Can you imagine? Abraham's describing this. See, most people want to know, where did we get the genealogies? Well, if we go back to Genesis chapter 1, and we go through these stories, what we can conclude is that Abraham had the book of records, the genealogy. That book is going to be passed down to his son Isaac, and then, of course, to Jacob as part of the birthright, and it's going to continue on, go down into Egypt. It's going to come back with them. So we've got this record of all of this. So this is, in Abraham's mind, as he's coming in and he's talking about this, Moses is writing it, but he's getting this from Abraham. And Abraham says, it was like the Garden of Eden, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan. And Lot journeyed eastward, thus they separated from each other. Now, the reason that Lot didn't defer to Abraham is because he was very selfish and greedy. He wanted first choice because he wanted the best. He, or I should say he wanted what he thought was the best. He didn't want second best. He wanted best. You know, it's one thing if you got ten people, and now we're going to divide it between ten. It's another thing to have two. Okay, I don't get the best, but I get second best. But oh no, he didn't want second best. He wanted the best. Now, let me point out three things about Lot's choice and what it has to say about his character. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. It might be on the note card that we have. First of all, the only factor that Lot considered in making his choice was material gain. In other words, he only looked at it from a financial standpoint. He never even considered if his choice was God's will or if it would be good for his family or how it would affect him spiritually. All he was concerned about was if it would make him richer. Would it, would it, would it make him grow his flocks and his livestock? Would he become even wealthier? And that's the only thing that he considered. Look at verses 10 through 13. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan. And Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. Now, do you see what this says? It says that he moved his tent near Sodom. And it specifically states that the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinners against the Lord. You need to understand, the whole world's into sin because they're not monotheistic. They're not serving and, and worshiping only one God. 
They are serving and worshiping idols. They believe in all these other gods. They got carried away into mythology. And a lot of that stemmed from the Nephilim that we studied. Now, all of the people were wicked. But they tell us that they were exceedingly wicked. As we get further along in the story, we're going to find out why. They were involved in homosexuality. And the book of Romans, the first chapter, tells us about the devolution, in other words, the downward spiral of mankind into sin. And if you notice, when you get to the bottom, it's what? It's homosexuality. Women who are having sex with women and men who are having sex with men. And so they were sinners exceedingly, and it's bringing that out. Now, here's what's interesting. Lot knew that, but it didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was material gain. Now, what's sad is that most of us do the very same thing. We just deceive ourselves or we tell ourselves that we don't, but we do. We act just like Lot. We choose jobs, schools, friends, and even churches based on the potential for material gain. We don't even consider how the choice might affect our family or our spirituality. The only thing that matters is material gain. Is this good for me financially? Now, if you're guilty of that, you need to pay close attention to what happened to Lot because it didn't work out the way that he thought it would. And I can promise you, if you're making all of your decisions based upon is this good for me financially, it's not going to turn out good for you. I can promise you that. In fact, it ruined Lot's life, and we're going to see that later on in life. I'm telling you, he hit rock bottom. The second thing I want to point out is how selfish his choice was. As I said before, when Abraham graciously offered to him first choice, Lot didn't hesitate. He didn't even pretend to decline the offer. Huh? Instead, he immediately jumped on what he thought was the best choice. He didn't care if good old Uncle Abraham, who had shared his wealth with him from the land of Egypt, had good land or not. The only thing that he cared about was what was good for him. Now, I'm going to give you a principle, and I want you to write this down. This is a principle you need to teach your children, and you need to look at at least once a week. Here it is. Anyone who's too eager for material possessions will step on others to get it. Let me say that again. Anyone who's too eager for material gain will step on others to get it. People, it's a fact of life. The reason people sell drugs, knowing that it's going to ruin other people's lives, is because of money. The reason people take advantage of women and children through pornography and prostitution is because of money. And it's not just in illegal activities that we do these things. I've seen business people run roughshod over others because of money. Now, what they do might not be illegal, but it's not ethical. And that's what Lot did. But the reason he did it was because of his desire for material gain. He went ahead and he breached the custom of the time. He didn't give deference or he, he, he didn't actually come in and say, no, 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 you go first. What he should have done because of all that Abraham did. No, he ran roughshod over him and he was going to step on him in order to get material gain. And people, that's a principle of human nature. If we're not careful, if we're too eager, eager for material gain, we will step on people in order to get it. Now, trust me, it's not worth it. I could have made a lot more money than what I make today as a pastor if I'd chosen a different career. But you know what? Money was not the determining factor for the decision I made. First of all, I received a divine call. Now, I ran from it for two years. In fact, I had in my mind at the time... We had bought the jewelry store. We opened up another jewelry store. We had a couple of other businesses. I was working at Southwestern Bell. And I had it all figured out that everything would be paid off in seven years. Actually, we could pay it off quicker. We could pay it off in five. But, you know, if we were a little more comfortable, we could pay it off in seven years. And then when I was 30, Lord, I could retire and then go into the ministry. And God's kind of funny. He said, no, I've not called you to do that. I called you to be a pastor. Now, when he called me to do that, my relationship with God and how it was going to affect my wife and my children spiritually 
were the determining factors in choosing to be a minister. And every man should always consider what his choices are going to do or how they're going to affect his family. People, Lot didn't do that. He didn't do that. He didn't even think about, how is this going to affect my family? He knew that the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked. We're going to find out later on in the story how exceedingly wicked that when these two angels from the Lord come into the city, these men are going to gather around Lot's house, pounding on the door, wanting to sodomize them. He knew all that, but it didn't matter. All he could see was dollar bills. And he ended up losing his wife physically and his children spiritually. If you remember the story, his wife was turned into a pillar of salt when she looked back as they were fleeing from Sodom after the two angels warned them that God's going to destroy Sodom. He told them, get out, don't even look back, but his wife turned and looked back. Now, if you go to Israel with me, we'll go down to the Dead Sea, and we'll go to what's called the pillar of salt. Supposedly, this is, is Lot's wife. But I'll be honest, she would have had to have been 20 feet tall because that's how tall he is, but anyways... But we'll go there and we'll see this. We're going to see that area and what happened as a result of God bringing destruction upon it. But not only that, his daughters ended up getting Lot drunk, their own father drunk, and seducing him. So his grandchildren are also his children through incense. I'm sorry, incest. Now, did you catch what I said? His children were also his grandchildren. They were his grandchildren because they were his children's children, but they were his children because he fathered them. So the whole race, the Moabites, actually are descendants of Lot, and they came into being through this incestuous relationship. Incest. Great choice, Lot. But we don't understand. When the only determining factor to whether we take this job or not, or whether we move to this city or not, or whether we open up this business or not, or whether or not we choose this career, is money, I promise you, it's going to bring you heartache. Lot didn't even come in and, and say, well, let's pray about this. Well, let's think this over. Oh, no. Cha-ching, cha-ching. Man, I can get rich down there. Now, the third thing that I want to point out concerning Lot's choice, good, plenty of time, is how easily he was beguiled. Now, does everyone know what I mean when I use the word beguiled? The word beguiled means to be deceived or to be duped. You see, Lot really thought that he was getting a great possession when he chose the plains of Jordan around the city of, of Sodom. To the outward eye, and the person who's thinking only of material gain, it was a dream come true. And you couldn't have better land. It was like the Garden of Eden before God destroyed this, this portion of the land. But people, it was deceptive. Because even though it looked so good financially, it was an evil place spiritually. And the trade-off wasn't worth it. But that's the way the devil works. That's how he works. He promises you good things, but it always turns out bad in the long run. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. The evilness of Sodom didn't corrupt Lot or his family overnight. It didn't corrupt them immediately. And that's part of the story because God wants you to see the devices or the methods of the devil. He wants you to understand how temptation works and how we backslide and how we go from being in this right relationship to God to rock bottom. Like Charlie Sheen, maybe. How do you do that? Because sometimes we see Christians slide down to that. So what happened? Well, let's look at it. Because to me, this is very interesting. This is how sin works. It's deceptive. As I said, we don't backslide all at once. We backslide through a series of steps. In fact, I want you to notice how Lot was sucked in over time. In verse 12, it says that he moved his tents near Sodom. Didn't want to go into Sodom. That's sin. But boy, that land's good. So guess what he did? He moved his tents near Sodom. Look at verse 12. Abraham, or Abram, because God hasn't changed his name yet, but it's the same person. 
Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents near Sodom. Now, later on, we're told that he moved into the city of Sodom. Look at Genesis chapter 14, verse number 12. And they also took Lot, Abram's nephew, in his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. Okay, so he starts out, he pitches his tent near Sodom. But after a while, you know, you get desensitized to sin. It's not as bad as it looks. And you know, there's a lot of nice things in here. So now he moves into the city. And then finally we're told that he actually becomes a leader of Sodom. Did you know that? Turn to Genesis chapter 19, verse number 1. Now, the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. Now, you need to understand something about their culture. When you go to Israel, we'll go to a lot of the ruined sites, to a lot of the tales, and you'll be able to see how the city was what laid out. And the majority of the time, there were three, what they called, gates. And you were able to come in where the leaders were, and that's where you came if you were new into town, or you had business to conduct, or you needed to see the judge. Now, listen to me. The leaders of the city were the ones who sat in the gates. So what this is saying is that Lot became a leader, one of the mighty leaders of Sodom. Now, you need to understand something about the devil. The devil works through increments. It's called incrementalism. Now, what I mean by that is the devil doesn't tempt you to do something big all at once. What he does is he places you around something until you become desensitized to it, and then he tempts you with it. And then if you give in to it, he tries to convince you that it's okay, it's normal. It's not sin. Everyone does it. And once that happens, then he moves you on to the next step. It's in increments, incrementalism. Is everyone following me? And then he places you around that until you become desensitized to it. And then he tempts you with that. And when you give in to it, he tries to convince you that it's okay. It's not sin. Everyone does it. And once that happens, then he moves you on to something else. You see, you don't go from worshiping God and loving him to the very next day, you're addicted to heroin. It doesn't happen like that. Or you're worshiping God on Sunday morning and Sunday night you've moved in with someone. It doesn't happen like that. It happens in increments. Now, would you like me? Well, before I give you an example, let me just explain something. What the devil does is he actually comes in and he tempts you in increments, step by step, gradually, until he sucks you in deeper and deeper into sin, further and further away from God. Now, let me give you an example that you can apply. Nudity in movies. I was on vacation last week, and I saw three movies. I went to Battle Los Angeles. I want to say Battle in Los Angeles, but Drew said, no, it's Battle Los Angeles. And then we went to Lincoln Lawyer, the Lincoln Lawyer, yes. And then we went to the mechanic. Now let me just tell you what Lisa and I do. We always look online at the movies we're going to go to, and we're going to see what they're rated and why they're rated that way. And we went and searched it out, and it's a me the mechanic was nothing but violence. You know, you see that all the time on the news. So no big deal, we'll go to it. And we're sitting in there, and nudity comes on the scene, on the big screen. Now, I'm going to tell you what Lisa and I normally do. We get up and walk out. That's right. It doesn't matter how much money I pay. We don't do that. But we're with another couple. And I'm thinking, oh, great. You know, they're going to think I'm a prude. They're probably already going, oh, it's the pastor. What's he going to think? And I'm thinking, do I make them even more uncomfortable by getting up and going out? So I stayed through it. But let me tell you, when I walked out, I told Lisa, I set my boundaries. I don't do that. Now, some of you don't see anything wrong with it. But that's because you've been desensitized to it. Let me tell you, that nudity in movies is pornography. Our word pornography actually comes from two Greek words, pornea, which means sexual immorality. 
Well, you get our word fornication, but it means more than fornication. It refers to all types of sexual immorality. And the word grapho, which means to write or to draw. So would you like to know what pornography is? It's when you write or draw scenes of sexual immorality, any type of sexual immorality. So when you begin to see these types of scenes, I want you to understand something. That's pornea. And the Bible tells us to do what? To flee pornea. Now, this didn't happen over time because I remember growing up and you never saw a woman's breast. And I can remember the very first time that I ever saw a woman's breast. Went to a movie. It was, oh my gosh. Because when I was growing up, if you saw that, it had to be rated X. But not today. No. Today, you've got direct TV, you've got cable TV, you've got Showtime, you've got Cinemax, you've got HBO. Yeah, just take a look at that. It, it's coming in. But it didn't happen all at once, people. It happened in increments until you were comfortable with this. When you were comfortable with this, then they moved to the next step. And when you were comfortable with this, well, it's okay. It's not sin. Everyone watches it. Then we moved to this. Before long... We're just watching this all the time. We don't think anything about it till I come to the movies with you. But it's wrong. We've done the same thing with homosexuality. You know, the first time, I, mean, I, I didn't know what a homosexual was until I was in sixth grade and we went down to New Orleans on a vacation. We were walking down Bourbon Street and I saw a man kissing another man and I said, Dad, what is that? He said, son, that's a pervert. <laughs> and he explained to me what it was. I didn't know any homosexuals in high school. You know, we, we joked about it. And I can remember when the sitcom Soap came on, and they depicted the homosexual as flaming, and it was funny. And so what happened is they desensitized us to it to being funny. And then they moved into funny but a little bit serious, the next step. See, it all happens in increments. And then here and then here, and then here, to the point now that I'm politically incorrect to tell you that homosexuality is wrong. But the Bible says it's an abomination. You can't get around it. But why don't we feel that way? We don't even like the pastor to say that from behind the pulpit. But let me tell you why. We moved near Sodom. And then we got comfortable. It's not that bad. And look how good it is. And I can get a hundred different TV shows with this. So we became comfortable with it, gave into it. Then we moved into Sodom. Well, I'm still not really a contributor to it. But then we became comfortable with it, desensitized to it. And pretty soon we're a leader with it. And the pastor's a prude. People, that's the way it works. And the whole reason that this story is in here is to show you the contrast between Abraham's character and Lot's character and to show you the difference in the outcome of their life. By the time we get to the end of the story, because really Lot's not even that big of a part of the story. The main thing is Isaac, the promised child. And then we get to Jacob and Esau and the 12 tribes and the nation of Israel and how the seed of the woman is going to come through them in order for Abraham to be a blessing to all the people or to people of every nation. But why is this thrown in here? Because God wants to show us why Job, a Job, Lot, got into this situation. How he ended up here where he had lost everything. He'd lost his wife. He had not only lost his kids spiritually, but he had fathered children by his own children, and he was living in a cave. And that's where America's going. And I might be a prude, but I will teach it. And if we're down to 15 people, we're just down to 15 people.